hello everybody you're watching the book of your channel and today i'm going to make a audio book of my brief history by stephen hawking the most brilliant scientist of his generation started by new statesman and at first i'm going to read the contents of it number one a childhood number two St. Albans, number 3, Oxford, number 4, Cambridge, number 5, Gravitational Waves, number 6, The Big Bang, 7, Black Holes, 8, Caltech, 9, Marriage, 10, A Brief History of Time, 11, Time Travel, 12, Imaginary Time, No Boundaries, and at last here comes the illustrative credits and for at the first uh, in this very video I'm going to read the childhood part and then now I begin my father Frank came from a line of tenant farmers in Yorkshire England his grandfather my great-grandfather John Hawkins had been a wealthy farmer, but he had bought too many farms and had gone bankrupt in the agricultural depression at the beginning of the 12th century. His father Robert, sorry, his son, his son Robert, my grandfather, tried to help his father but went bankrupt himself. Fortunately, Robert's wife owned a house in Borough Bridge in which he ran a school, sorry, she, she ran a school, and this brought in a small amount of income. They thus managed to send their son to Oxford, where he studied medicine. My father won a series of scholarships and prizes, which enabled him to send money back to his parents. He then went into research in tropical medicine, and in 1937, he traveled to East Africa as a part of his, that research. When the war began, he made an overland journey across Africa and down the Congo River to get a ship back to England, where he volunteered for military service. He was told whatever that he was more valuable in, he was more valuable in medical research. My mother was born in Dunfermline in Scotland, the third of eight children of a family doctor. The eldest was a girl with Down syndrome who lived separately with a caregiver until she died at the age of 13. The family moved south to Devon when my mother was 12. Like my father's family, hers was not well off. Nevertheless, they too managed to send my mother to Oxford. After Oxford, she had various jobs, including that of inspector of taxes, which she did not like. She gave that up to become a secretary, which was how she met my father in the early days of the war. I was born in January 8, 1942. Early, oh, sorry, exactly 300 years ago. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Let me begin with the first passage. Sorry for my mistakes because it's my first audiobook. I was born on January 8, 1942, exactly 300 years after the death of Galileo. I estimate, however, that about 200,000 other babies were also born on that day. I don't know whether any of them was later interested in astronomy. I was born in Oxford, even though my parents were living in London. This was because during World War II, the Germans had, a, had an agreement that they would not bomb Oxford and Cambridge in return for the British not bombing Heidelberg and Göttingen. It is a pity that civilized sort of arrangement couldn't have been extended to other cities. We lived in Highgate in North London. My sister, Mary, was born 18 months after me. 
and I am told that I did not welcome her arrival. Although our childhood, there was a certain tension between us. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. All through our childhood, there was a certain tension between us, fed by the narrow difference in our ages. In our adult life, however, this tension was dis has disappeared as we have gone different ways. She became a doctor, which pleased my father. My sister Philippi, Philippa was born when I was nearly five and better able to understand what was happening. I can remember looking forward to her arrival so that there would be three of us to play games. She was a very intense and perceptive child and I always respected her judgment and, op and opinions. My brother Edward was adopted much later when I was 14, so he hardly entered my childhood at all. He was very different from the other three children, being completely non-academic and non-intellectual, which was probably good for us. He was rather a difficult child, but one couldn't help liking him. He died in 2004 from a cause that was never properly determined. The most likely explanation is that he was poisoned by fumes from the glue he was using for renovation of his flat. My earliest memories is of standing in the nursery of Byron High School, House School, sorry, in Highgate, and crying my head off all around me. Children were playing with what seemed like wonderful toys, and I wanted to join in, but I was only two and a half. This was the first time I had been left with people I didn't know, and I was scared. I think my parents were rather surprised at my reaction because I was their first child and they had been following child development books that said that ch children ought to be ready to start making social relationships at two. But they didn't know, sorry, but they, they, but they took me away after that awful morning and didn't send me back to Byron school, sorry, Byron house for another year and a half. At that time, during or after, just after the war, Highgate was an area in which a number of scientific and academic people lived. In another country, they would have been called intellectuals, but the English have never admitted to have any intellectuals. All these sp parents sent their children to Byron High School, which was a very progressive school for those times. I remember complaining my parents, complaining my parents that the school wasn't teaching me anything. The educators at Byron's house didn't believe in that. What was then the accepted way of drilling things into you? Instead, you are supposed to learn to read without realizing that you were being taught. In the end, I did learn to read, but not until the fairly late age of eight. My sister Philippa was taught to read by more conventional methods and could read by the age of four, but then she was definitely brighter than me. We lived in a tall, narrow Victorian house which was my parents which my parents had bought very cheaply during the war, when everyone thought London was going to be bombed flat. In fact a V two rocket landed in a few houses away from ours. I was away with my mother and sisters at the time but my father was in the house fortunately he was not hurt and the house was not badly damaged but for years there had been a large bomb site down the road on which i used to play with my friend howard who lived three doors the other way howard was a revelation to me because his parents were not intellectuals like the parents of all other children i knew he went to the council house, council school, not Byron House, and he knew about football and boxing sports that was that my parents won't have dreamed of following. Another early memory was getting my first train set. Toys were not manufactured during the war, at least not for the home market. But I had a passionate interest in model trains. My father tried making me. I wouldn't train but that didn't satisfy me as I wanted something that moved in its own. So he got a second hand clockwork.
crane, repaired it with a soldering iron and gave it to me for Christmas, which I was nearly three, when I was nearly three. The, the crane didn't work very well. My father went to America just after the war and then, and when he came back on the Queen Mary, he bought my mother some nylon, which were not obtainable in Britain at that time. He brought my sister Mary a doll that closed its eyes when it lay, when you laid down and he bought and he brought me an American train complete with a cow catcher and a figure eight track. I was still re I can still remember my excitement as I opened the box. Clockwork trains which you had to wind up were all very well. But what I really wanted were electric trains. I used to spend, spend hours watching our model train club layout in Crouch End near Highgate. I dreamed about electric trains. Finally, when both my parents were away somewhere, I took the opportunity to draw out of the post office bank all of the very modest amount of money that people had given me on special occasions. Such, such as my christening. I used to use the money to buy an electric train, but frustratingly enough, it didn't work very well either. I should have taken the fed back and demanded that the shop or manufacturer replace it, but in those days, the attitude what was that it was privileged to buy something, and it was just your bad luck if it turned out to be a faulty. So I paid for the electric motor of the engine to be serviced, but it never worked very well even then. Later on in my teens, I built model airplanes and boats. I was never very good with my hands, but I did this with my school friend John McLenahal, who was much better and whose father had a workshop in their house. My aim was always to build working models that I could control. I didn't care about wh how, what they looked like. I think it was the same drive that led me to invent a series of complicated games that Wheat and the school friend Roger Frenau. Frene, I don't know the pronunciation. It was Roger Frene, eh, eh. I don't know the pronunciation. There was a manufacturing game complete with factories in which units of different colors are made, roads and railway on which they were carried and a stock market. There was a war game played on board of thousand, 4,000 squares and even a feudal game in which each player was a whole dynasty with a family tree. I think these games as well as the Rain, boats, and airplanes came from an urge to know how systems work and how, con how to control them. Since I began my PhD, this need has been met by my research into cosmology. If you understand how the universe operates, you control it in a way.